about the only booktuber who seems to dislike summer. Hello booktube, it's Leah Cooper here and today I'm bringing you my June wrap up part two. I have a mug full of iced coffee because it's my only cold comfort right now and six more books to talk about. So all total I read 17 things this month but I, I want to emphasize things. Three of those things were just short stories, individual short stories. So I mean, you know, ranging in ranging from three to 30 pages. So you know, they don't weigh in quite as strongly as some of the other things I read. I also read four graphic novels total this month. So they only take a couple of hours to read. So it's not like I read 20,000 pages. I only read about 4,400 pages total this month, including the short stories and the graphic novels and everything, which is kind of I want to say actually kind of my average I I seem to be reading about between 3500 and 4500 I think the most I've ever read in a month was 4700 so actually it was kind of on the higher end of my average which is great and after starting off the month on a real miss which was a conjuring of light I have a full like spoilery discussion of why I didn't like that book. I'll link it up above if you're interested. So after starting off really not in a great place this month, the, the second half of the month, like since I filmed my part one wrap up, I've just read a ton of really pretty good things. So let's get started. Let's get let's get into it. First thing I'm going to talk about is Arcadia by Ian Pierce. I don't have a copy of it anymore because I finally returned it to the library. I saw this book mentioned originally on Jen Campbell's channel. It's a book that was kind of spiritually inspired by his dark materials, which I had only read the first book of at the beginning of this year. And I decided to finally, you know, knuckle down, read the trilogy so that I could read Arcadia. So Arcadia is a little bit complicated. It has multiple timelines, multiple points of view. There's a scientist named Angela Merson from a quite distant dystopian Earth future. Now she's a scientist. She, she's working on this this project to create a device that will allow travel between the multiverse because in her time Earth is running out of resources. It's way overcrowded. So her employer believes that if they can access the multiverse and the resources of other versions of Earth, they can both send people there to, you know, lighten the population load of the current Earth, but also strip them for resources. And whoever controls this technology would obviously be very rich. And the prevailing belief in the scientific community of Earth at this time is that time travel is impossible and it's all multiverse but Angela believes that time travel is actually possible and that there is only one universe and so it's kind of I don't want to say heretical because it's not technically religion her her theory is very out there no one agrees with it lots of stuff happens Angela ends up having Angela ends up kind of stealing all of her data for the device and using it to try to to time travel back to the past so that she can continue her research without being bothered. Um, in the past where she goes, it's, uh, n well, she originally comes back to Earth in the late 1930s, right before World War II. But the bulk of the novel actually takes place in a couple decades later in 1970, I believe, when a friend of Angela's, a friend that she has made in, you know, our time, essentially, a literary professor named Professor Lighton has been working on writing this novel that's set in a universe and his whole his whole purpose in creating the universe like he's going really slow and being really meticulous as he wants to make a fictional universe that works and unknowing like unbeknownst to him Angela has taken his idea and used it as a framework in the device she's building to test her theories and so she's actually turned his fictional world into a real world and it's accessible through an archway that she's been hiding in his basement and obviously you know another character a young woman named Rosalind stumbles upon the archway and travels through it into Angela's created universe and everything kind of spirals out of control from there and it's really interesting really philosophical it flips back and forth between timelines between universes between characters it was pretty good I gave it four stars it was a little I don't know if I want to say it was slow to get into because the last 100 
and 50 pages are distinctly like so much more gripping than the rest of it but there were so many parts as I was reading it when you kind of see the pieces start to interconnect that they just made me go oh 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 that's what that means and so it was like it was a really satisfying book to read it, I did have to take I think 10 days to read it like how to read it in small portions because it wasn't something I could sit down and read like 150 pages of at a time otherwise it was a really fascinating novel it's definitely science fiction with fantasy elements because the alternative world is a fantasy world if you kind of like maybe more classic sci-fi because it also read a little bit more like you know classic 70s sci-fi in some respects not in all because it, it's not a space opera it's more of like a really grounded philosophical novel and it has such a great ending i mean i would highly recommend it to people who like kind of thought-provoking books but definitely worth the read so i've rambled on about that enough the next thing I read is The Duchess War by Courtney Milan, and this is just a historical romance novel. I had it on my Kindle. I think I picked it up free at some point, like she ran a free promo and I picked it up. I follow her on, on Twitter. She's a pretty big name in the romance community and I had never read anything by her before and one of my kind of goals for the second half of this year is to really work through the unread books that I have on my Kindle because I have a lot of just indie published books for one thing that I would love to read and be able to review and a lot of stuff that I've just picked up on sale or on a free promotion and they're just languishing there so I decided to go ahead and give this a try because I just wanted something light and it was a lot of fun I gave it four stars it was kind of like a 3.75 but the one thing I will say is that as I was reading it whenever I put it down I always wanted to pick it back up again and that's always a really good sign for me like I didn't have to tell myself oh you have to read this or you need to get your reading done today I was just like oh I want to go read this book so yeah it had pretty interesting characters a actually quite good hero because I'm not I'm not into the whole like possessive alpha male hero and this guy wasn't now this story takes place in gosh uh, late 19th century it's, it's the Victorian period I believe and there is a duke obviously and he's like a political radical he wants to basically dismember a peerage like he really hates his dead father and because he was a total asshole he hates the fact that like so many of the peers control all of the wealth and don't take care of people so he's very like pro-union and he's been making these pamphlets and publishing them for the working class to like educate them and to inspire them to uh, work together and that's very uh, seditious seditious kind of pamphlets and he is doing it because he knows as a duke he no one's no one's gonna come after him like no one's gonna throw him in jail and he he so he has the privilege of being able to put those out without fear of reprisal and so that's one of the reasons why he's doing it and so he's come to this small town where uh he oh his father owned a factory and ran it to an it, it into the ground and he wants to uh kind of flesh out why there were so many people arrested for sedition and tried and jailed and stuff like that so then we also have a young woman whose name has flown out of my head it's like Mila that's not right Minerva her name's Minerva she's going by a different name though because she lives with these two great aunts and her parents are dead and we don't really know much about her because she's she shrouded her entire past in history in, in mystery because she was involved as a child in this like scandalous thing that we don't know what it is but it it ruined her and so she had to take up she had to take on this assumed name and now she is extremely poor her aunts are very poor and she has to marry because she's you know getting older and she has no money and her aunts are not gonna have any money and stuff like that you know pretty typical only enter this constable character who is like I know you're living under a fake name and I'm going to figure out you know who you really are and he thinks that she is the one behind these pamphlets and so that's how she and the Duke they bump heads essentially and it's quite an interesting book it's quite fun like, like I said the characters are really great I do like the hero the love interest the Duke um, because he's not a totally gross alpha male character 
I like Minerva. She's really clever. She's really smart. She also uh, has to wear glasses, which it's so rare for like a female love interest to have glasses. Like I feel like it's just kind of rare for characters in general to have glasses in books. And so I mean that's totally like a random thing but it's stuck in my head as like oh that's so cool. I really like the supporting cast. So this is the first book in a trilogy called The Brother Sinister. And so the it's the Duke and his brothers and I liked both of those other brother characters and so I kind of want to get the other two books to read. I'm on a book buying band so like I can't buy them right now but I kind of want to. So anyways if you like historical romance, if you like kind of like Victorian romance, you like smart heroines and not like the most intelligent but like really kind heroes, love interests, check this out. The next three things I read all go together. I actually still have physical copies of them. That is the Grisha trilogy. Maybe I should do it like this. Okay so I read Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Ruin and Rising in about a week. No, nah, 10 days. Earlier this year I read Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom and really loved them. Everyone had said you didn't need to read this trilogy to get Six of Crows and you certainly don't have to read this to get Six of Crows. There are a bunch of cameos from characters in this book, these books, this trilogy, in Crooked Kingdom. Now I wasn't confused or lost at all when I read Crooked Kingdom. There was some stuff that was kind of like spoilery but not totally spoilery. I, there were still like surprises in these books and I will say reading these definitely makes me want to go back and reread Crooked Kingdom so that I can see those cameos now that I know more about those people but irregardless you can totally read either series first. So I gave this one four stars. I gave Siege and Storm three or three and a half stars. I think I gave it three on Goodreads but it's like a three and a half for me. And then I gave Rune and Rising four stars again. So overall the trilogy is like 3.75, 4. Well no I'm gonna say 3.7 or 4. I wouldn't read it again because I don't really like Elena or Maul. I'm not gonna give a summary. Everyone knows what these books are about. So I liked Elena okay in this one. I wasn't like a huge, I wasn't a huge fan of Mal, Mal. I kind of vacillate on whether I like him in this book. Both of them were kind of wishy-washy. Both of them were a little bit ridiculous. I liked the Darkling in this but I wish we'd gotten more of the Darkling. Overall that's kind of my thought. I really wish the Darkling had had more character development because I just, I don't want to call him like a gray villain because he's not. He does a lot of really bad things. But I feel like, you know, Kaz Brecker does a lot of really bad things, but we get so much of his backstory. He's sympathetic. And I feel like the Darkling could be a really sympathetic villain too, but we just don't get enough with him ever in any of the books for me to really have any sympathy, but I like wanted it. One of the only times I will say I wish we'd had like from the point of view of the villain. Like I never say that, but in this case I kind of would have liked it. Siege and Storm. Okay. So a lot of people feel, I think, that this is like second book syndrome. It's really slow. I actually like the plot of this one for the most part. Yeah, like for the most part I actually really like the plot of this one. What I didn't like was Alina and Mal. Like I really didn't like them in this one. The only saving grace is Nikolai and that's kind of true of Ruin and Rising. I think Nikolai is a fantastic character. Like Nikolai is one of the, is, is an example of why I actually like Lee Wardugo because like I really love her characters in Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. Like every single character I am super invested in. I love, cried, I laughed, I was just like heart sick over, etc. So Nikolai is one of those characters that was like every time he's on screen it's pretty great. He's funny, he's entertaining, he's interesting, and etc. He's also like pretty consistent. He's a tricky character who changes a lot but like all of the things he does and says make sense for his character. Alina in this is so goddamn wishy-washy. She's all like I want to run away, I want to save Ravka, I want to run away, I want to save Ravka, I want to fight the Darkling, I want to join the Darkling. Like make up your damn mind and be consistent and don't change it every other chapter, okay? That's the thing, she flip-flops between what she wants even within the same chapter and I understand that in some respects that's accurate but like she didn't seem to under to have any sort of base driving force of any kind except maybe to be with Mal but then she kind of throws that out the window and I really hated Mal in this. He was like super weird and gross and possessive and it's like 
dude, we get it. You and Alina are fucking love, star-crossed, destiny, blah, blah, blah. Nikolai gets that too. He's just grinding your crank. Could you stop acting like a twat over it? Anyways, I didn't like them. And so that's why it's three stars because I just didn't like them. I liked everything else. It was fine. I don't mind middle books. I think a lot of people find them kind of fillery. I don't necessarily. <sighs> so then we got to Ruin and Rising, which the first like 175 pages of this were really slow to get through. And I was like really having to remind myself to read it because I just didn't like Alina and Mao. But then Nikolai showed up and literally the book got 10 times more interesting and more exciting. What can I say? But also I will say in the second half of this book, Alina is much more consistent as a character. Like she stops kind of being wishy-washy and flip-flopping and that really helped it too. So that's why this ended up getting a four stars. It's just because like her character like settled down. Wishy-washy is such a vague way of describing a character, but if you read the first two chapters of A Court of Thorns and Roses, that character is pretty damn wishy-washy too. Saying one thing, saying something contradictory the next paragraph, then saying something else contradictory the paragraph after that, totally changing her mind on the next page. That's what I mean. And that's what Alina does, and it's just really annoying. Maul was so much less obnoxious in this one, like, and admittedly it was because he had like, he had kind of given up, but still it was just like, thank God, no more of this like weird alpha possessive bullshit. That being said, because I don't like them, I would never read it again. Like Six of Crows, Kirky Kingdom is totally on my reread list because I am so invested in Kaz and, Kaz and Inej. Like I said, I really want to reread Crooked Kingdom to get all the cameos. If she ever puts out a book that's like about Nikolai, damn, I will be all over that because he's just, he's a really interesting character. If you've read that trilogy, let me know what you think of it down below. If you, if you agree or disagree. Last thing, last thing I read this month, Trillium by Jeff Lemire. I only gave this three stars. It's a graphic novel. It was written and illustrated by Jeff Lemire, which I thought was really cool. I do like the art. It's really well done and like the art really fits the story. Uh, it is about a scientist from the future. She lives in a time when there's only like 4,000 humans left alive. Their colonies have been attacked by the sentient virus that's been killing them all. And she's on this planet trying to communicate with the natives of the, this planet because they have a flower that grows called Trillium that can be used to make an inoculation against the sentient virus. It's also about Will, who is a soldier. Uh, he was a soldier in World War One. He has PTSD. And now he is trekking through the jungle on like a science archaeological, eh, I'm gonna use that loosely, archaeological mission with his brother for fun because it interests him because he wants to escape the war in England, etc. Their paths cross essentially. They both find this tomb, her on this alien planet in the far distant future, him in the jungles. They meet, there's lots of like, well, time travel, space travel, multiverse swapping, stuff like that. For the most part, I thought it was really interesting. The first half was really good. When they like multiverse swap, it's really interesting. My issue was, there's this love story thing that sort of gets shoehorned in in the last third that I felt was really out of place. And <laughs> I almost feel bad saying that because there's an author note at the end about how he really wanted to tell, from Jeff Lemire, talking about how he really wanted to write this like epic sweeping love story. And I'm like, they meet for five seconds, a temple gets blown up and they swap realities until they eventually find each other again. That's not a love story. They knew each other for five seconds. I just, I hate, I hate. It's like they were already in love before they met. I hate that. So it really ruined it for me. I think this would have been so much more interesting as an exploration of the duality of self if it would have been an exploration of gendered selves because they also it's kind of hard. Well, actually, I don't think it's that hard to see if you look here, you look at this picture. They look a lot alike, like they look really similar, like they could be two halves of the same person. So I just feel like it would have been a much better story of a fractured self, duality of self, exploration of gender, just 
anything other than a love story. I don't think a love story worked. Also, there's horrible white colonialism. That whole like white people going into the jungle. Gotta watch out for those, you know, brown savages. They're gonna kill us, skin us, eat us alive, etc. And I mean, probably accurate for the characters in 1921, but that doesn't mean that I have to like it. End of story. Especially when it's not really challenged. I mean, there is a little bit in her reality where she's like, no, we have to like learn about the natives and we have to communicate with them. We can't just like blow them up. But then her superior blows them up anyway. So it's just like, yeah, a little bit too much. Not, not a fan of that and that stereotype and all that sort of stuff. So only three stars. Had a lot of potential. I could have see. I could see this kind of as the basis of a really cool movie, but it would need a lot of changes because it just. I hate the love story. I read quite a few things. Like I'm actually kind of shocked because I've been playing a lot of Warframe this month, and I didn't think I'd been reading all that much, but I have been actually reading a decent amount. So uh, let me know if you've read any of these things or if uh, they sound interesting. You're gonna pick them up, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.